economics of cybersecurity. Good morning, everyone. This is my first time with a Mac, so if I mess up, apologies in advance. Now, first of all, thank you very much to B-Sides for the opportunity to speak. Uh, this is a topic that's near and dear to me. And um, why are we having this conversation? We're having this conversation because, first of all, besides on the, on, the, on the CSP, we had something that was interesting, something that was of interest to you. And well, this fits the bill perfectly. Fundamentally, why are we talking about economics in the security conference? We're talking about economics here because it's my firm belief that understanding the economic reality of where security fits is essential for us to have any effect as, an, as a security professional, right? We cannot just appeal to the better angels of people's natures, it just doesn't work, right? If we understand the economics behind it, it helps move our cause along. Also, it's interesting because once you understand economics, just some topics anyway, you start seeing them all over the place in security areas, and that's what this talk is about. Uh, uh, Scott Adams, from Dilbert fame, he referred to economics as having kind of a superpower, and it's somewhat true. But um, most of the topics for, for this came out of uh, a massive online course I took uh, earlier in the, in the winter. Did anyone take the edX uh, cybersecurity course? Nope, okay. Um, anyway, so why are we, uh, let's take a look at a couple economics concepts and we'll see where they apply in, in security. A little bit about me. Uh, I'm a, system, I'm a sales engineer, at the, I just switched jobs, I'm now at a startup that does on the network security micro segmentation side of the house. I've been around for a while, you can tell from the gray hair. I like to say that uh, my, um, my degree now is old enough to drink, right? I've, it's a <laughs> <laughs> and I became very interested in finance and, and economics when I first bought a house, right? So way back when, uh, this huge mortgage, what, what the heck is that, right? And then from there you start going into, um, into finance, you start understanding how investments work and whatnot, and that led to an interest in, uh, in economics overall. And I have a, a, a I mentioned edX earlier, I'm a, I'm a fan of Coursera, and I'm taking the data science specialization there, I'm almost wrapping up with that, so it's, it's, it's a great time to be a, a, a learner. So let's quickly talk about uh, a few uh, basic economic concepts, and we'll, we'll go from there. Economics is broken down into two major fields, right? One of them you, you call macroeconomics, and macroeconomics is fundamentally the study of the economy at large. It's uh, understanding interest rates, uh, what's going to happen to the Canadian dollar now that uh, Keystone was rejected. I mean, so what's that kind of conversation, right? It affects our pocketbooks when interest, inter, ah, interest rates get set. It affects our, uh, the, the, the health of the economy overall. But as far as security is concerned, it's not really a major factor for what we're talking about here. Microeconomics, though, is much more interesting. Microeconomics is the study of human interaction. It's the study of how we as individuals and the, or as companies deal with scarce resources. Economics is fundamentally the study of scarcity. And it is uh, built around the notion that we have individuals that are going to interact in a market. Those individuals will buy and sell different types of goods. There is what we, we may have heard, the supply and demand of, of those particular goods. And it's interesting because microeconomics kind of assumes that individuals are rational and they are going to maximize their utility. They are going to do transactions in a way that's going to get them the best outcome that they want. Right? That's, that's fundamentally classical economics. And then there's a couple of interesting sub-areas to it. Uh, information economics being one because information goods are different and we'll see that later on. And also, uh, decision and, and, and game theory, right? You may have heard of game theory. Funny story about game theory is that one of the first courses I signed up for in Coursera was on game theory. And um, the amount of people who signed up for that course thinking it was about video games was <laughs> staggering. <laughs> anyway, those are two major areas. 
But uh, there's a third area that's not really part of, considered a third part uh, of economics, but I think it's important enough that we should highlight it out. It's called behavioral economics. And behavioral economics is a combination of microeconomics with psychology, with finance, with sociology, what have you. And it deals with the fact that, uh, as it says there, the bounded rationality of economic agents. Basically it means that people are not rational and people make mistakes in predictable ways, and those ways represent themselves into the, into the economic transaction you're going to be dealing with later on. The, uh, this gentleman here, so uh, Daniel Kahneman, his, uh, he won the Nobel Prize for his work in, in uh, behavioral economics. He wrote a famous book called Thinking Fast and Slow. I highly recommend it. Uh, Richard Thaler is the guy in the back there. He wrote a, a book uh, called Nudge, again, about how, how you can use behavioral economics to nudge people to do things. There was a very interesting talk at B-Sides here last year. Uh, Augusto Barros delivered on, uh, on, on behavioral economics overall. So I recommend you to go watch him. I think Augusto is going to be here later on, so you can hit him up about it as well. But anyway, behavioral economics then deals with these biases that we have and how, they can, how we can affect what we do. Now, I talked about markets earlier, right? So what is a market? First of all, a market is more of a model than anything else. There is no perfect market. But if it did exist, it, I mean, you'll, you'd see that a market is where buyers and sellers interact to, to exchange goods. And in the market, the price for a particular good is a signal both to the buyer and to the seller of whether you should be producing more of that good or you should be consuming more of that good, right? That's, that's basic economics. Now, what happens is, again, the market is more of a, of, a, of a construct than anything else. And for a market to work as it's supposed to, th there's many conditions that should happen, right? One of them is there should be a large enough number of people involved in the market. Uh, there's something called property rights. We'll talk about that in a second. There's something about information that people should know what they're buying and they're selling, right? We, again, we expect humans to be, uh, the market expects humans to be rational and so on. If those things don't happen, you get into what's called a market failure. And a market failure is not necessarily a stock market crash. What a, a market failure is the market not behaving in a way you, you would expect it to. If you don't have enough buyers and sellers in a market, what do you have? You get into what's called a monopoly or a monopsony, which is when you don't have enough, uh, enough buyers. Why is a monopoly bad? Well, a monopoly is bad because it, it, it's inefficient to begin with, and, but also it allows it it means that price no longer functions as a good enough signal. And why, where do we have monopolies? And, and, and it's, it's a rational expectation for someone to try to fix that. So let me throw an IT concept at you guys. Everyone here has heard of shadow IT, right? To what extent doesn't sh didn't shadow IT grow as a, as, a, as a phenomenon in our companies because of the monopoly of IT services provided by IT, those services were considered too expensive. Well, it's the rational expectations for users to go find an alternative. And that's why shadow IT grew, right? That's how economic applies to security. There's other concepts as well. So uh, the, the notion of property rights. What do I mean by property rights? It's a phenomenon where if you're doing a transaction in the market, you should pay the full cost of that transaction or you should capture the full benefit of that transaction. And if you don't, you have what's basically called an externality. It means that you are not being told, uh, let's say that you are producing a good. If it costs you two, if it costs you X to produce that good, but the overall cost of that good to society is 5X, you don't know that. You're going to keep producing X. So pollution is a perfect example of an externality. In security, we have externalities as well. Why don't people care if their machines are infected? I don't care. I mean, it's, it's not, not going to affect me. I'm just going to re-image it, right? That's an externality. Other kind of failures, uh, if we don't have perfect information about the transaction, you get into what's called information asymmetry. And that's, a, and that's one of the key areas for security because we will find later, security is something that you can't really evaluate. Security is more of a latent construct, we call it. Right? So security is something that you can't really measure, so it's difficult to, uh, to know if something is truly secure or not. And that's a, that's a cornerstone of, the, of this area. Now, there's other things as well. Uh, if, you if you don't have rational actors, you get into the biases. I spoke about behavior economics earlier on. 
And there's other things. If you have, for example, very high transaction costs, it means the market doesn't behave as well. Uh, and you may get into scenarios, one thing that's called, for example, regulatory capture, which is when uh, someone tries to use the rules of the market to kind of monopolize it. And uh, I'm just using an example, not naming names, but or, I mean, I am naming names. Uh, Fire, I tried to do that uh, earlier this year with that regulation about, hey, if, you're, if, you're, if you use FireEye, you can now be cer certified against, uh, uh, you, you're, uh, you're not liable for particular uh, cyber, cyber, cyber terrorism examples. Anyway, that's an example of a market failure. This, you may have seen, you may have seen some of this before. This is a basic uh, curve, right? You, you have a demand curve and you have a supply curve, and this is just an example to show that the price for a particular good is when the supply curve and the demand curve kind of meet. And they tend to meet at the point where it's called the marginal, so that in a well-functioning market, the marginal cost for a good, how much it costs to produce that next good, ma uh, is matches the marginal demand, which is how much someone's willing to pay for that particular good. And, that's where the, and, and that is where the price is, where the marginal cost meets the marginal demand. Why is this important? This is important because if you look at the typical marginal cost, it starts off very high when you're building a product, and then it sort of levels off, and then at some point, when you run out of capacity, it, it spikes up again, right? Except that this is a marginal cost for a physical product. For a digital product, it's different. A digital product behaves more like this. You start with a very high marginal cost, and, it, and uh, uh, the marginal cost tends to towards zero as you have more quantity. It's just very easy to issue another CD, right? It's a, the cost of a download, right? So this is fundamentally what people mean by information wants to be free, <laughs> right? It's the idea that the marginal cost for information goods tends towards uh, zero or very low. So this means that information goods behave very differently. If information goods behave differently, what do, they, what do I mean by this? They have very high fixed costs and very low marginal costs. We spoke about that already. It's an economic reality that in that kind of market, the only rational way for a company to survive is to try to monopolize that market as fast as it can. And if it's going to monopolize that market as fast as it can, it means it's a market race which means that there are things like first mover advantage. There are things such as network effects, right? There are things such as effect to, co to appeal to complementary goods. Let me give you an example of that. Why did Microsoft win the desktop battle? My, uh, you, you may, anybody here remember seeing the, the Steve Ballmer video, developers, 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 right? He was absolutely right. That's an appeal to complementary goods. You're trying to get your product out the market as fast as you can, and you're trying to get other people to use your product so that your product is going to be the basis for an ecosystem. I venture to say that, for example, uh, I mean Microsoft did it extremely well. I venture to say that Splunk is doing that really well right now, using building apps on top of Splunk. I would say that to some extent uh, Threat Connect, who's doing threat intelligence, is trying to do that as well, build a community around your product, right? There, and this is important because it means that if you are a security individual within an organization, you are not going to be able to stop this, right? Again, doesn't matter how much you want to appeal to people's sense of what should be done. This is how the market behaves. And if we don't recognize that, we are going to fall flat on our faces. I, uh, the other concept I want to talk about was information asymmetry. Information asymmetry is the notion that you don't know the quality of what you're buying, right? So, and this is the typical example. That it's a paper by uh, George Akerlof in the early 70s called Market for Lemons. It's about a used car. If you don't know the quality of a used car, how much you're going to pay for that car is going to be uh, different than if you knew the quality of that car, which means that and, and, and the, the, there's a tendency on the market for that, for, that, um, for that price to tend to drop. So if you are, a, if you are selling a good car, you're not, going to, you're not going to accept a bad price for your good car. So you're going to step out of the market, which means that on aggregate, the market is going to shift towards lower and lower and lower quality. Right? This, is, this is something called adverse selection, and we see that in insurance all the time. How do you solve information asymmetry? There's two methods. One is called signaling, the other one's called uh, screening. Signaling is, as a buyer, you try to show that your product is good. That's when you say something, it's like certified, right? Uh, 15 point, 500 point, 1,000 point inspection, whatever. 
That is a signaling mechanism. And from the screening side of the house, you might, you might ask your buyer to go through so many hoops to prove the quality. And anybody here has worked on RFPs before, right? Anybody feels that, the, the, anyway. Uh, <laughs> That's why, right? Why do we go through RFPs? Because it's important to answer. The buyer is trying to screen us for because of an information asymmetry. So we, when you start looking at some, these concepts, so you start seeing them applied on, on security all the time. Any one of these topics now could be a whole lecture on its own. But software development and, and basically systems design, right? There is a tremendous information asymmetry in that you don't know if, the, if the something is secure or not. There's a paper by Ross Anderson back in 2001 that pretty much launched the discipline of economics of information security. And if you can't tell that it's secure, it's not rational for a company to invest in the security for that product. They're going to invest the minimum necessary to get the job done, right? So it helps explain some of that. Also, you start seeing into the externalities I, I, I mentioned earlier, right? Why did we have heart bleed last year, right? Why is such an important library? Why, why was there no more effort on that open library? Well, because everyone can free ride on open source, right? Why, do, why is patching such prevalent, so prevalent now? Because it's not in the best interest. It, it's, it's an economic incentive for a, for a software vendor to, okay, I'll just issue a patch later. They're not paying for the cost of that patching operation. So this is just an example an example of an externality at play. This paper, this just came out uh, this month. It's an, uh, on, on how the Google ecosystem, you have, um, on the Android ecosystem, this is a paper that was published on WISE just a few months ago, that, uh, sorry, this month, that 88% uh, of Android devices have been exposed to at least one major vulnerability out of 11 that they looked at. Why is this? Because there's no economic incentive within, the, within that trend market transaction to do that patching. Right? So this is just an example. Privacy is another area where we see a lot of, of uh, impact of, of information, of uh, economics. As an individual, trying to, how people say they want to behave with private, how, how private they want to be versus how they actually are is a key area of, of, inf of security research on, on economics. Here is where those, those biases come into play. There's something called hyperbolic discounting, which means that that bias means that you value the present a lot more than you value the future, even if the future is significantly more, should be significantly more valuable. Or this is an example why people are going to click on stupid stuff all the time without thinking of the consequences. They are not, it's not that they are stupid, it's they are human, right? And if we don't recognize that, if we build our systems expecting them to behave differently, we are going to fail. It's that simple, right? The other thing about privacy I think it's important is the notion of capturing the, the people's uh, intent to pay. It's not, it, it, people want your private information, not because they want to sell you better ads. They want, to, they want private information because they want to sell you their product at a different price. If they know that I'm willing to pay 200 bucks for something, and you know, they know that they, you're willing to pay 300 bucks for something, if they are able to be in a monopoly situation, they will do that, right? And that's where, that's why privacy is important. Risk management is a, a, an area all on its own. Um, there is, I highly recommend people check out uh, uh, CIRA, the Society of uh, Information Risk uh, Analysis. They, they just had a conference back in, uh, back in early October now. But the notion of security investments, well, where they play in, into, um, into economics. There is information asymmetries at play here. The, one example of an information asymmetry that someone pointed out to me was that on, in risk management is, let's say that and this was an example that an audit came back with a high risk, a particular issue on an audit was rated high. Well, the individual that managed that group, they fought not to fix the vulnerability. They fought to move the vulnerability from a high to a medium. Why did they do that? Because the incentive at play was that medium vulnerabilities didn't get reported up the food chain. Right? So that's an example of, an information, of how information asymmetry affects the decisions that we take. Previous to my role in, uh, in network security, I was big into, into uh, fraud, and this is a huge area for economics, right? Not only you have the notion of incentives about credit card fraud and the, the 3DS, uh, the, 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 the just uh, the, finally the US caught up with EMZ just now the, for uh, chip cards, but 
market studies, like the underground markets, they are extremely interesting from an economic scenario. The economics of the underground markets are an area of research on its own, and that these markets have evolved extremely well. The reason they have evolved is something that's called, in my theory anyway, something called the Red Queen hypothesis. It's the idea that if you don't evolve, you die. Right? So these markets have evolved. And it means that you as a security uh, professional, it may be better for you to understand the economics of how that market is behaving and try to stop that. To use as an example, maybe it's easier instead of, I mean, you, you do what you can to secure infrastructure, but maybe if, you under, if you're worried about credit card fraud, maybe you stop the cash out at, in the end, as opposed, to, as opposed to just worrying about the security up front, right? Security awareness, as you can expect, is another huge area for information, for economics, in the, in the terms of behavioral economics plays a huge part here, right? How, how people should react to stuff is going to depend on how we incentivize them. Like, I work in sales, and, and sales incentives is something that, that pops up all the time. That's, a, that's an example of it, but you also have that in, um, in just everyday life. If you're not incentivizing people to respond properly to security, they're not going to. There was um, the, the, the principal agent problem pops up here as well. There was a controversy a couple of weeks ago. Uh, some very senior executive, uh, some very senior official in the US government was saying that they want to pull, they want to pull clearances of anybody who falls for phishing attempts. I'm not sure if anyone, if those people saw that. You know what, and, and there's some pushback against that, and I, and, I, and I understand and I agree with some of the pushback, but you know what, that's not a bad idea. If you, hold, if you have a top secret security clearance, you should be able to respond to phishing much, much better, right? Maybe not the first fish, maybe not the second fish, but the 50th fish, yeah, sure. <laughs> Here's an example of behavior economics in action just now. Google pushed this out just a couple of weeks ago, and they made a change on the, they made a change on how the browser reports uh, mixed mode or, or poorly configured HTTPS. Why did they do that? Before, it used to be that there were multiple states for how the browser was reporting SSL or uh, bad HTTPS. Now they simplified it, right? Now there's only three. Why did they do that? Because they understand that the users are going to respond to the signals from that environment differently. And I want to wrap up the, the, the examples with something that's near and dear to us, the security labor market itself. All of us here, some, uh, some were asking about who wants, who, who's looking for, for work, and very few of us are, which is a good thing, but fundamentally there are consequences to that as well, right? One of the things might be that what's the opportunity cost of paying our salaries? It means that an organization may not be able to purchase the tools they want to purchase, and they may have to do with other things. Another consequence of that is that uh, your vendors <laughs> might have a bigger economic point of making of, okay, let's reduce, let's automate to reduce headcount. So it, once, you st once you start thinking in economic terms, it pops up all over the place. One thing I like is that I hope that understanding information asymmetry helps settle the question, should I get a certification or not, right? If you look at certification as a signaling mechanism, then you understand for yourself whether in your scenario it might be valuable or not. What is a certification if not an intent to signal to your employer, potential employer, that, hey, you care about this industry, you care about this area, right? By the same token, you should expect very weird and very nitty-gritty uh, interview questions. Why is that? That's a screening mechanism at play, right? The vendor, the, 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 your employer, your potential employer doesn't know if you're good or not. So how are they going to try to do that? They're going to try to screen you with stupid questions. And yeah, uh, or, and, and, uh, but again, it's not that people are stupid. It's the economic reality of, of why these things are happening. So that's the message I wanted to get across here. Once we understand the economic reality of things, the world becomes a lot more rational, <laughs> and, and we can function in that a lot better. So let's wrap up. We, present, we, we looked at a couple of key concepts here. We looked at what markets are or what markets and how a market can fail, an example of market failures. I'm a huge believer that uh, information asymmetry is a key concept for us to understand. And if, uh, if I could do, I'm not gonna do a, a Steve Ballmer dance here, but if I could, I'd, I'd, instead of shouting developers, 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 I'd be shouting incentives, 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 right? Until we understand that and, and, and until, until we can uh, work those into how we do our, our work, we're gonna fail, right? 
Just a couple of key areas for us to consider. I think that behavior, end user behavior, both for end users as consumers of security as well as end users as, as employees of your company. I think it's important. I think risk management is a key area for this. And then uh, software development, we saw that already. I'll wrap up with a call to action. Number one, as, as consumers, as yourselves, right, when you walk out of here, think about, try to think, try to look at the transactions you do from an economic perspective. Why do you buy what you buy, right? What, what does advertising is trying to tell you? What incentives are being done to you? Buy this product because you're going to look cool. Buy this product because it's going to save you time, right? As a citizen, we just, we just went through the election not too long ago. Understand the incentives at play for government to do that. I mean, economics, there's a huge area of, of uh, public choice theory and understanding how economics affects public policy. But understand the incentives at play for economics. Why are someone offering you money, uh, a particular benefit to you in an election campaign? Think about, if you, once you start thinking about the reality of economics, it, it, uh, it's, uh, I'll go back to, uh, to uh, Scott Adams. He said that uh, he was going to, he, his idea was to create a, po a political party that was nothing but sound economics. It wouldn't do well, but it would be, it, 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 it would be a, a rational party. And then finally, as, as professionals, right, we, what we're doing here, understand the right levers that you need to pull in your particular fields. Right, publishing that report that has these vulnerability findings well, understand the incentives for addressing those vulnerabilities, for that those findings or not. And then I'll leave you just with a, with a comment that I presented the concept of an externality earlier on. An externality is when someone tells you to do something and the person who's telling you what, what should be done doesn't really pay the cost for that. Isn't that the perfect description of what we do with security overall? And how are we going, and, and then we complain that users don't follow our policies. Well, I'm here to tell you that the reality of it is users not following those instructions is perfectly rational from an economic sense. And we'll get better at our jobs once we understand that and work that into our conversations. Thank you very much. I'll have the, <laughs> I'll have the slides up. Slides will be up on slide share. Yes, sir. I think so. I'm sorry, I didn't quite get the middle part. So the question was if we can combine human uh, understanding of, of, of human hacking with the economic behavior, uh, the, and, the, and the answer is absolutely, right? I, I, um, I'll have on the slide notes uh, later on some more references for, for sites and, and things like that, but there is, um, there is a very interesting project coming out of Norway called the Security Culture Framework that Kai Rohr uh, runs, and uh, that talks to some extent about how, security, how culture affects security, and we can mix economics into that as well. And you seem like I have another question? So Thinking Fast and Slow is an interesting book because it describes how people have two systems called System 1 and System 2. And System 1, I, I'll, I'll get this wrong now, I hope Augusto's not here, if he can help me out, or anybody else. So you have, Psychologically, you have two systems. You have something that thinks about uh, what you're going to be doing, and you have things that react much more instinctive, right? And the interplay between those two systems, called system one and system two, means that you can only dedicate so much effort to one. And if you try to tax the user with too much, uh, I believe it's system two, thinking, the user will at some point start reacting with their system one, which is their instinctive stuff. Let me give you a very practical example. You give the user a warning 
big, big warning saying, hey, you have to read all the security policy and whatnot. And the user has a deadline, right? They're, they're, they just want to get through. Okay, they'll click okay without, you, without thinking for a second, right? Fast or slow. <laughs> so the idea here is that absolutely, so uh, Daniel Kahneman is a good source for this. You also have other writers on, actually, if you want to look at system one and system two, there is a post by Gunnar Peterson that uh, where he wrote security fast and slow. I'll put it up on the, on the links on the, like, on the presentation later. This, if you search for Gunnar Peterson, Gunnar G-U-N-N-A-R, uh, and system one, system two, I think you'll find it. But I'll put it up. Any other questions? Uh, sorry, sorry, go. Uh, so presumably if you, like, I want you to do a long call. On one side you say that you want to call your friends first, right? And the other side you say that the enforcement technology matters to set up an organized community to survive. So you need to monetize the market, right? So I think the contract is still running on the whole thing. How, how can you set up? I, I wouldn't say that. So the, the comment was that the monopoly is bad and then that companies trying to, uh, the, the rational response for a company is to monopolize and this being a contradiction. I wouldn't call it as much a contradiction as that there are different points of view. It means that for the market itself, it's better if there is no monopoly. For you as a consumer, it's better if there is no monopoly. But for a company, especially, an inf especially a company dealing in information goods, it is very much in their interest to become a monopoly. And it's the rational response. Becoming a monopoly is the only way a company can survive in a market where the marginal cost is going to tend towards zero. So I wouldn't call it necessarily a contradiction. Yes, sir. How do we create better economic incentives for security in the IoT space? I'll take a pass now. Let's, let's work this. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll do the consulting after. It depends. <laughs> really, this is, this, is a, this is a big conversation, and I think that it, it will come back to who are we trying to incentivize? Are we trying to incentivize the users to think about security? Are we trying to incentivize the vendors to think about security? Are we trying to incentivize a regulator to think about security? Uh, on that note, in terms of multi multiplayer talks, uh, there is a very good, there's a, an effort, for example, by uh, Alan Friedman in the US government about how to have multi-party talks in terms of vulnerability disclosure. I would say we could use that as a model for this kind of conversations. Also for IoT security, the work that OpenDNS was doing uh, that Andrew Hay and uh, Mark Nunikoven uh, put out uh, earlier this year was very interesting on security as well. Thank you very much, everybody. It's a, an honor to be here.